Fructose is more metabolical than I thought. Metabolical. That's kind of a funny word, isn't it? That's because I just made it up. It's a portmanteau between metabolic and diabolical. But now that I have your attention with my nonsense language, I wanna get serious and talk about science published in Cell Metabolism, which talks about synergistic ways in which fructose, the sugar fructose, inhibits fat burning. I group it into four ways and we'll go through some of the data. And by the end of this video, I bet if you're not already against fructose, you will really think twice before having a sugar sweetened beverage or dare I say it, too much honey. Welcome to my channel. Stay curious. So in this video, I'm going to talk about four mechanisms by which fructose inhibits fat burning. Transcriptional, post-translational, mitochondrial, and metabolical. But before I do that, I do need to arm you with some background so you can really follow along. So pay attention because this is going to set the foundation for you really understanding by the end of this video those four mechanisms. First bit of background has to do with the central dogma in biology, which is how DNA gets turned into protein. Simply what happens is DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA is then translated via ribosomes into proteins, the functional units of your cell. Okay, so transcribed is DNA to mRNA, translated is mRNA to protein. So now I've defined transcriptional, transcribed. Now post-translational is what happens afterwards. So once you have the protein, the protein can actually be tagged with things via other proteins like phosphate groups or acetyl groups, which change the function of the protein. So that's post-translational. Now, mitochondria, what I'm referring to here is the idea that mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, are actually very dynamic. They're not just like homogenous block. They undergo fission, they break apart. They undergo fusion, they come together, and this changes their function. And if you want to deep dive into that, I actually did another video on that, which you can find linked below. Now, finally, I want to introduce two players that will be key to this story. One's called CPT1. CPT1 is a carrier protein or has carrier function, which helps get fatty acids across the mitochondrial membrane into the mitochondria where they are burned for fuel. So if you can't get fatty acids, longer chain fatty acids into the mitochondria, they can't be burned. So CPT1 is the rate limiting enzyme in fat burning. So its function is very important and key to this story. Now, the last player that I want to introduce is ketohexokinase, which is involved in fructose metabolism. And for the purposes of this video, all I really want you to know is that if you block ketohexokinase, knock it down, then you're blocking fructose metabolism. So that should be sufficient background. Now I want to get into the mechanisms, starting with one, transcriptional. One experiment the researchers did is take mice and feed them separate diets for 10 weeks. One diet was a high fat diet, by which they actually mean a Western diet, so high fat and high carb. And and the others were high fat plus glucose or high fat plus fructose. And what they then did was look at transcription of the protein CPT1A. You can do this with a technique called RNA-seq, but they're looking at the messenger RNA of CPT1A, which again is the rate limiting enzyme in fat burning. So lower levels are gonna mean you're less able to burn fat and higher levels are gonna mean you're more able to burn fat. All other things being equal, we'll get to that in a little minute. But what you're looking at here in this figure is expression levels. On the y-axis, you have CPT1A and mRNA levels. So in this case, I guess you can think higher is better. And on the x-axis, the minus means without an siRNA and the plus means with an siRNA. siRNA is a technique for knocking down a protein. What are they knocking down? Ketohexokinase. So basically, in a nutshell, what you're seeing in this figure is CPT1A levels on the different diets. And then what happens when you knock down, that's the plus, the ketohexokinase enzyme, which would block fructose metabolism. So really the question they're asking is, well, what happens to levels of this fat burning protein at the transcriptional level, again, mRNA generation, when you knock out ketohexokinase? And what you see is across all groups, there's an increase in CPT1A levels when you knock out ketohexokinase. What this is really saying is that fructose metabolism is important in regulating the rate limiting enzyme in fat burning. And that when you decrease fructose metabolism, there's an increase in this protein that would facilitate fat burning. Now, it's important to check if this change in mRNA actually changes the protein levels downstream. So what they then did is something called a Western blot. And basically what you're looking at here is thicker means more protein. And again, what you see is when you knock out ketohexokinase, there is more CPT1A protein. Again, summary point. Fructose metabolism is important in regulating the rate limiting enzyme in fatty acid burning. And when you have more fructose metabolism, there is less fatty acid burning enzyme. And when you knock out fructose metabolism, you boost fatty acid burning. 
So that's part one, transcriptional. Part two is post-translational. Now, I put it in this order because it just kind of made sense, but I'm not gonna go into this section in too much detail. What you need to know is that, again, once you have a protein, it can be modified in function by adding different groups to it. One group is called an acetyl group. And one thing the researchers did is look at changes in the proteome, the acetylome, if you wanna call it that, with ketohexokinase knockout. And what they found is massive changes in the acetylome with addition of fructose and ketohexokinase knockout blocking fructose metabolism. Just making the overall point that even once you have the proteins, the protein function is modified by the presence or absence of fructose in the diet and overall fructose metabolism. So you have changes at the DNA transcriptional level and once you have the protein, you have changes in function by adding acetyl group toggling on and off protein function, which is really cool. But moving on, I wanna get into maybe my favorite, which is point three, mitochondrial. So as I said before, mitochondria are really dynamic. They undergo fission, breaking up, and fusion, and this changes their function. Simply, while you do need a balance, I think for this video, you wanna think of too much fission as a bad thing. So breaking up mitochondria, fracturing them, if you will, wouldn't be a good thing. It would be more of a bad thing. And what you find is that with fructose treatment, mitochondria tend to undergo a lot more fission than fusion, and they break up, and you end up with these little mitochondria, which you can literally see here on electron microscopy. When there's fructose, the plus F, there are smaller mitochondria, they're broken down. But but then what happens when you block fructose metabolism, when you block ketohexokinase enzyme, when you do that, the mitochondria don't undergo as much fission and they end up staying big and healthy, if you will. So what this is saying is again, fructose metabolism is important in controlling mitochondrial morphology and as a function of that, mitochondrial function, which is really cool. At least I think it's really cool. Hope you do too. Now, finally, moving on, point four. This is what I'm calling metabolical and it has to do with insulin resistance. Now, insulin resistance is something you probably heard before, whereby your body is resistant to the hormone insulin. So typically what happens is you get hyperinsulinemic. Your pancreas spits out more insulin in order to get your body to get the signal, right? Your cells are kind of going deaf, so the pancreas is shouting louder and louder by spilling out more insulin. But here's the catch. One of the big problems with insulin resistance in humans and why it creates so much metabolic dysfunction is because not all cells and all pathways in cells are equally insulin resistant. It's actually a pretty selective process. And the reason this is a problem is because when you become insulin resistant, what that means is that some cell signaling pathways are gonna be understimulated, but because it's selective and your pancreas is trying to compensate by spitting out more insulin, and there's a really, really high insulin, you're hyperinsulinemic, in those pathways that aren't resistant, they get overstimulated. So that's what selective insulin resistance is. I think it's really important to understand. But what happens with fructose, and this has been shown in other studies, is that fructose uniquely promotes insulin resistance. So then what happens is you get hyperinsulinemic. And this hyperinsulinemia can actually over inhibit a protein called AMP kinase, which is a really important regulator in your cell. And by inhibiting AMP kinase, it means AMP kinase can't do its job. AMP kinase, one thing it does is inhibit a protein called ACC1, which is important in generating a metabolite malonyl-CoA, which itself inhibits CPT, which is important in fatty acid oxidation. That's a lot of mumbo jumbo. I just threw a lot of terms out at you. But the basic premise is this, that insulin resistance induced by fructose causes hyperinsulinemia. And that hyperinsulinemia is blocking fatty acid oxidation via selective insulin resistance at a systemic whole body level. So those are the four mechanisms, at least how I group them. There's transcriptional, post-translational, mitochondrial, and metabolical. So I think this is really interesting. I hope you do too. But I wanna caveat this and say, I'm not trying to fear monger. I know I joked about honey at the beginning and I think eating oodles and oodles of honey probably wouldn't be a good thing for your liver or overall health, but it doesn't mean you can't have honey or fruit. In vivo, living humans eating a complex diet, there are a lot of variables at play. In fact, your intestines can actually bioconvert small doses of fructose into other sugars to attenuate harm. If you wanna have some blueberries in your diet, go for it. But I do think talking about these sort of data are useful I'm not trying to fear monger, but I think we need to think more critically and nuanced about how different metabolites impact our health. Because often we want to reduce it into, oh, this is just excess or empty calories, but it's so much more complicated than that. And until we appreciate that as individuals and as a population, I don't think we're going to be able to really take the bull by the horns in terms of commanding our metabolic health. I just think this is really cool. And I hope by the end of this video and other videos that I share, you just get that enthusiasm for how 
complex our biology is and just how impactful what we eat is on our biology at a systemic and at a cellular level. Metabolism is really cool, way more cool than my plate and energy balance. So let's get beyond that together.